Hey, this is my, uh, my, my third uh, B-Sides, and uh, I, I just want to thank you know, Dan and all the other folks that have uh, put these B-Sides on, because this, this session has been better than the last one, and which was better than the one before. I'm just so impressed at, at, at how good these B-Sides uh, conferences are. So, so really, you know, thanks, thanks to, to the folks that put in all the work. Hey, so um, uh, my, my colleagues wanted me to, to, to uh, title the, this uh, uh, presentation differently. They wanted me to, to call it uh, Data Exfiltration for Dummies. But uh, I, I thought that may not be uh, very good with my uh, uh, professional standing. So I gave it an innocuous name, a name that you'll, you'll, you'll never remember. Uh, but the, the premise of the talk is, is, is that there's lots and lots of ways that you can exfiltrate uh, data, even significant amounts of data, from, from relatively uh, uh, secure networks. Uh, I'm going to be talking about uh, you know, our, our top 12. Um, and w what I find is that when I first go to a, uh, a client, uh, six, eight of these top 12 will, will, will always work. So it's, it's pretty common. The, these, these things can be carried out by non-technical users with no elevated privileges. I'm not even talking about local admin privileges. It, it's very, very simple to, to, to be done. Uh, importantly, it's unlikely to be detected by the organization uh, in, in real time or even in, in kind of the, the event monitoring stuff. Um, there, it, it's, it's widely effective across uh, uh, virtually all of the, the networks that I'm going to be in. It's, it's not zero day or any of the heady stuff that you, you know, you've been hearing about today. The reason for the talk, actually, my motivation is that there's very, very little awareness uh, of, of these suscept susceptibilities. That's probably not a word I want to use because I can't say it. Um, among uh, uh, IT practitioners. And what's clear to me is that if you're not aware of these susceptibilities, they're, they're not going to be fixed. It's not just that the next rollout of, of, of some one of the systems is going to uh, uh, happen to uh, uh, pick this up. Okay, so, so it, it's really kind of a bold premise on my part to say that it's, it's so easy to be done. Uh, I mean, what makes me say that? Um, just a, a quick background on me. I'm an IT auditor, uh, no booing, please. And uh, uh, I've been uh, running with, with my colleagues, uh, you know, a, a boutique type of IT uh, audit firm. We do some direct uh, audits. But most of us, most of the work that we do is, is, is outsourced by, to, to CPA firms and, and some other firms. So in the, in the last two years, I've done about uh, 100 uh, I, um, uh, audits. That's one a week. And boy, it feels like one a week. Uh, it's, it's predominantly in, in regulated industries because those are the, the only people that are going to pay for an audit. So it's uh, financial institutions, banks and credit unions, uh, healthcare, hospitals, uh, health centers, and to a much lesser degree these, these, these other areas. I have never been to a defense uh, 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 network, so I'm, I'm sure that those are much better off than the financial stuff. Yeah. Okay, so, so the, the assumptions, um, again, I'm, I'm talking about uh, 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 an environment in which security is, is, is mandated, meaning that they have requirements to protect the data on their network. So they're supposed to be taking it seriously. Um, the user that, that I'm looking at that's going to be exfiltrating the data has no technical training, no elevated privileges. The data set size could be you know, megabytes up to gigabytes. Per, you know. I'm not addressing how the, the user, the malicious user, is getting the data. I'm assuming that they have some sort of privileges on applications and somehow or other they can get to the data set. And once they have that data set, they're, they're just trying to figure out how to get it out and do something with it. Um, it organizational detection, and what I mean by here is, is that the, it's detection by the organization via, via their routine systems, their routine alerting systems, or even their event monitoring, which, which might take place you know, a day or two or even up to a week later. I'm not talking about the situation that after the data breach occurs, that 18 months later, their customers find out and it hits the press and then Mandiant and Verizon are all in there doing their forensics. And so I'm, I'm, I'm talking about a detection by the organization using their normal methods, not, not forensics. The, I mean, the forensics guys can 
you know, do some amazing stuff. So, okay, the, uh, typical typical environment: Windows Seven workstations in a Windows Seven uh, networking environment, pushing typical policies. Uh, I've already talked about you know the standard user level, web content filtering, and I've I've I've, I've seen them all. Uh, endpoint protection systems that are going to be restricting uh, read and writes on, on USB storage devices and CDs. Uh, antivirus system, you know, operational uh, patching systems for Windows and third-party apps, uh, and, and I'm assuming that that's all up to date. Centralized security event monitoring and, and alerting frameworks. I'm, I'm not addressing data exfiltration by, by email or, or, you know, someone using an SSL VPN or you know, their mobile phone or, you know, getting, uh, doing a, a bypass on an MDM. Okay, so the, 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 the top 12 that I'm talking about, I've categorized into, into um, uh, uh, bypass methods. The, the, the first one is, is, is bypassing the endpoint protection system uh, so that you can get to rogue storage device. The next one is bypassing perimeter protection so you can get direct access to the internet. The third one is bypassing web content filtering systems so that you can get to websites that, that would allow you to exfiltrate data. Bypassing firewalls uh, and then uh, bypassing the total network control fully. Okay, so starting off, uh, this is the first two. This is bypassing endpoint protection systems. Over on the right, I, I have uh, a little th threat uh, index. So the frequency of occurrence is how often I see it, and the organizational detection is how often when I'm testing, I get caught, okay? Because I test these things. These are all things that I've actually done on, on, on real networks. It's not my, like my home network that I'm doing this. I get to go in as an auditor and do things that other people aren't allowed to do. So I'm really talking about then if something is very common and very unlikely to be detected, I consider that a high risk. So the first, the first one is, is probably the simplest one, and, and this one almost always works. That is, you take your Android phone. This is not going to work with your, your iPhone. You plug, you plug it in, and it, and it shows up as a network adapter, okay? You double-click on it, and that network adapter magically turns, <laughs> yeah, magically turns, <laughs> see, this, I love it when, when people say that, they, you know, they already know about this, yeah, it magically turns into a, a, a USB device, okay? So what's, what, what's, what's fascinating about that is, is that this, this bypass works even in the presence of endpoint protection systems which have, which have intentionally or, or tried to lock down USB storage devices. Okay, so I'm not saying, this isn't like a home network where, where you're actually just, you know, just plugging into your home network. This is where people are consciously, have, have already tried to, 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 to shut this down. So why does it work? Well, part of the reason that it works is, is, is because it shows up as, a, as a, um, a media device first. And then importantly, the drivers are already loaded. It's not as if you need it's not as if you need drivers for, for, for this these particular USB devices. As a matter of fact, it'll try to update the drivers. If you tr if you try to if you allow it to update, it'll block it because you don't have a, a local administrative control. But the point is 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 that when you plug it in, it works. Now you have to be patient because it's going to try to index the phone, and if you're using large, you know, cards, it, it's going to be. Um, um, it, it's going to take a while to index it, but this one works almost all the time. It's it's just it's just such a such a, a, a simple one, and it, in terms of detection, again, I get the chance to play with this stuff. I have never been caught. It just hasn't been. It's it's, it's, it's it, and, and 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 as an auditor, I actually look through the, what they are doing to see whether or not they're actually doing the the types of alerting and uh, and inspections of their logs that they're supposed to be doing. Now, I find it in the logs, obviously, because I'm looking for it. But in terms of their, the types of uh, alerting that they are normally doing, it, it's, it, it doesn't show up. So, um, and even, even you know, when they do their, 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 their reviews a couple of weeks. And why? Because there's, not, there's nothing that's getting blocked here. So um, to stop this one is actually pretty tough. Um, so even if you're using, you know, the, the Lamentions or, you know, GFI or Semantic or whatever, 
you have to you have to make sure that you're stopping this, but it, you often have to push out policies, uh, you know, by way of GPO in order, to, in order to, to. It's like a belt and suspenders, you know. It's it's not easy to it's not easy to, to to stop this one. This next one, this next one, I I find really amusing because um, I've never really figured out. A, I've never been able to use a Bluetooth uh, file transfer for for anything useful, other than data exfiltration. So here you, you plug you plug. You plug a legacy Bluetooth device in. Why legacy? Because the drivers are loaded. Why? All right. Well, because you, you don't need local admin privileges. And and then all of a sudden, this thing you know pops up and it says, "Yeah, I'm a I'm a Bluetooth device. Let me pair to." Well, what? Of course, you pair to your phone. Now it's secure because you have to put the pin in, so that the transfer from the workstation to your phone is going to be very 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 secure. Um, but but it, 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 again, it works very very well. Um, very rarely do I see that there's even an attempt to block Bluetooth devices because USB devices, you know, they, 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 they're all identified differently. I mean, the, the um, storage devices, HID devices, Bluetooth devices, network adapters, they all show up differently, right? No one thinks about stopping a, a, a Bluetooth uh, device because they're useless, right? Except if you want to exfiltrate data. Um, in terms of the detection, again, as they say, I have the opportunity to play. I've never been, I've never been uh, um, picked up on it, uh, and there's no perimeter record here, so it's not going out through a, um, it's not going out through a, um, uh, a firewall or whatever. Now, forensically, I'm not trying to say that that this couldn't be detected because I mean it's going to show up in in in, in some Windows event logs that there was something inserted. I'm not saying that. But these are not the type of events that are, going to, that are going to go to the network operating center and someone's saying, you know, someone just did something that, that you know, I'm going to go down to their desk and find out what the, you know, is going on. So, okay. All right, so, so um, th this next one is, is uh, bypassing the perimeter protections altogether. And again, you can see my threat index over here. This one is again extremely common, and I've never been picked up on it. And and what you do here is you plug the device in, then you put your phone into tethering mode. Well, all of a sudden your phone then shows up as a NIC adapter, okay? And guess what? The NIC adapters are, have already been preloaded in, into into Windows 7, so no administrative uh, privileges are necessary in order to make this work. If it asks you to update the, the, the drivers, don't do it because then you'll get blocked. But you don't have to update the drivers because the ones that are installed work beautifully. So, um, uh, again, as a, as a NIC device, this is going to work even in the presence of endpoint control where, where, you're, where you're blocking, say, uh, USB storage devices. Okay, the next one, um, the next one is, is similar. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a little bit different, and, and this is my favorite D-Link uh, uh, USB NIC device. Um, and again, why did I choose this one? It's because it's legacy, the drivers are already there. And uh, this one is, is, is even better. I, I don't think I've ever been stopped using this one until the, you know, I mean, I go back the next year, sometimes they stopped me, but, you know. But I've never been stopped on first try on, on, on using this thing. So, you know, 20 bucks data exfiltration to your heart's content. The only problem there is you have to use your phone as a as a as a Wi-Fi hotspot, right? So that so that you can you know de, you know bypass the, the perimeter uh, and go directly out to your uh, um, you know to, to to the internet directly. The only thing that I would say here that sometimes happens, and this is about 50 50 percent of the time. It, that is, when you have both NICs uh, active, sometimes one of them won't be active. So you have to, the, the, you might actually have to unplug the, the RJ45 cable to deactivate the network, and then that makes this one active on the workstation. All that means is if you're going to do the data exfiltration, you'd have to take your data set that you want to exfiltrate, put it on the C drive, and then exfiltrate it. It's one more step, but if you're trying to exfiltrate data, you probably got the time, right? So, so again, uh, uh, endpoint protection systems are, are unlikely to 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 uh, alert on it. Was a question? Oh, sorry. 
uh, on an allowed event. Uh, again, the, 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 the event's going to be logged, but it's not going to raise anybody's concern because it's, 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 it's an okay event. And here there's no perimeter protection uh, um, um, detection whatsoever or record. Okay, so I've already showed you pictures. Oh, I, I, forgot, I forgot this, uh, the built-in adapter. Hey, so a, cup, a couple of years ago, people were going crazy uh, updating their workstations from, from XP uh, to, to, to Windows 7. I mean, everybody, everybody waited to the last month or two to get it done. I don't know why. But, the, but um, a, a lot of folks bought these uh, uh, cheap Lenovo um, uh, Think Center things. I, mean, I, I, I just see them all the time. They're about this big. They stand on the desk. It's, it, it's, a, it's a really nice little package. It's got... I think it's an i1 with like a gig of RAM, and it's, it comes equipped with, with the CDs, and that, that was a joke, incidentally. Um, it comes equipped with, with a, a DVD writer and a built-in Wi-Fi, uh, a NIC card. Well, in, in the rush to, to push all these things out, they never disabled the, the built-in uh, 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 Wi-Fi NIC. So I find that if, if those little things are sitting there, they often have the NIC cards, and then what you do is you just, you just enable them. You don't even have to do anything. You don't have to plug anything. They're already there. You just use your, your, your phone as, as, a, uh, uh, as a hotspot. Okay, so that's what that picture was there in the, in the middle one. That's the... Okay, um, bypassing uh, web content filtering systems. Um, and again, uh, I've, there's a lot of web content filtering systems. I've, I've gotten to probably see most of them. Uh, one of the most common bypasses that, that, that I, I see is, is that the web content filtering system is set up to allow things like BombGar or LogMeIn or go to my PC or our team viewer uh, because there's, there's a bit of a mistaken belief that you know, it, might, it might be necessary. So what you do is, is you, you go to one of these sites, uh, you, there's a free account if you want to, you, you, you set it up. And then uh, you you can exfiltrate data using these these remote control devices. I, I assume everybody's familiar with these things. Um, this isn't working quite as well as it used to because there, there's some ActiveX stuff that's now needs to be installed to do the transfer. So I think I think uh, Baumgar and TeamView are, are are working the best. But usually, I, I'm finding now sometimes the ActiveX controls are still getting installed even without local admin privileges. I don't quite get it. I know there's some weird stuff going on with the enterprise versions, but at any rate, that, that's still a, a, a good one if you want it. This next one is new, and, and that is, I, I'm seeing, I'm seeing uh, uh, customers going out to, to use uh, Office 365 for, for their email. So that means that they, 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 they use the browser and they, they have to get out to office365.com. Okay, I get it, so they, you, you open that up. But Microsoft, in order for that to work, also requires you to open up the .live and the .office. I don't get why, but they do. Now, everybody probably has a .live and a .office account because if you're running Windows 10, right, it's like, I mean, they nag you to, 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 to do a, the, one of these Microsoft accounts, and that, that gives you, you know, one of these accounts. So the whole point here is you've already got a free account that, that, are, that you're going to be able to use. Now, you're not going to be able to exfiltrate lots of data all at once, but, you know, 10 meg at a time or 20 meg at a time or whatever it is, is you know, you, you can get some, get some real stuff. Um, and further, you could have an Office uh, 365 account yourself like, like I do. So when I'm at my customers, I, I could just log on to my own account and exfiltrate data if I wish. Um, this next one is... is is, is, is really insidious, and, and that is web content filtering systems often default to allowing uncategorized uh, or unrated sites. And the reason for that is because people complain that if they go to one of these aggregate sites like the New York Times or whatever, if you, if you block uncategorized sites, all that crap that comes from the... From the, the uh, um, Advertises it all gets blocks and it makes it makes the website look really 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 ugly. So so the IT puts this stuff back. Well, what does this mean? What this means is 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 that if you register a new site for like five bucks or whatever it costs you at GoDaddy, um, you can you can bypass this, or 
let's say let's say if you um, you know want to find a new file sharing system, a file sharing site. I mean, how many of those are, are 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 coming on the market now? I mean, there's a new one every week. All you have to do is go out to the new one. It's not going to be categorized. It's a file sharing site. It probably is going to give you a free account just to test it, so that you can you know exfiltrate your data from 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 your secure network uh, to a free account and. There you go. So actually, this one's really insidious. When we do social engineering, we always get a new account, right? Uh, we you know, get a new $5 account. We send, we send that link in, in the email. Boom, they click on the link. There's no controls. That link is wide open because they don't, they don't block it. It's uncat. So I mean, this, this actually is, is, is a really serious uh, 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 control weakness. OK. So um, here, the, 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 the possibilities of organizational detection is a little bit higher because you're going to be, you're going to be in, in, there, in the, the, the logs in terms of where you went to and, um, uh, and, and um, uh, what you saw. But again, un unless you abuse it and show up as, as, as hitting a lot of uh, improper sites, you're probably going to uh, uh, not get caught. Again, I do this all the time, and I've never had anybody come to the desk where I'm auditing. OK, um, bypassing firewalls. Um, and, and you know, if this was two or three years ago, I, I probably wouldn't have included this slide because it would not have been consistent with that this has to be a non-technical user, OK? So, um, so in terms of setting up an FTP, FTP server to exfiltrate data to, a couple of years ago, I would say that, that that's in the realm of the more technically sophisticated. No longer, right? Because, I mean, I don't know. Last year, I went out and I, I, I think I dropped 50 bucks. I got one of these Netgear cheapo routers. You plug your USB device into it. And, and all of a sudden, that USB device pops up on, on, on the external net as, a, as a, an FTP server, right? It required, you know, it was maybe two points, two point and clicks in order to, for me with this $50 server to all of a sudden have a, 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 an FTP server that I, I could have. And it even gave me dynamic DNS, right? So I didn't even have to remember what the IP address if I, if I didn't have a, have a static. So I consider now FTP in the, in the realm of, of, a, of a, an FTP server in the realm of a, um, uh, a, a non-technical user. So what I, again, what I find is, is that FTP is, is, is often not blocked, uh, and sometimes it's not restricted by source and destination address. So if you happen to be on a, on a workstation where it's not, not properly locked down, golden. And again, if, if, if the firewall is allowing it, yeah, there'll be a, a record, but again, no, no alerts. RDP, again, I'd say is, is, is now in the realm of the non-technical user. And what, I, what do I mean by that? That same $50 Netgear thing, allowed me to do port forwarding, okay? Holy smokes. So for two clicks, I was able to, to, to forward 3389 to my crappy laptop. Well, I also forwarded 80 as, you know, to, to the crappy laptop, to the you know, 3389, so that I could connect to RDP on its normal you know, port, 3389. Or if, the, if, if they did some outbound filtering, which they often don't do anyways, because they, they're very poor at outbound filtering, I could, I could always use the universal bypass port, right, 80? And, and it's not like FTP, where you need multiple ports, which is a much more complex thing. So I mean, I don't even try to you know, put you know, FTP you know, over port 80 or something like that. So this works beautifully. It works beautifully. And RDP, right? All you have to do is drag and drop onto, onto the, the remote RDP you know, uh, desktop. So I don't know. I think everybody knows that Windows Explorer is, is a, a full FTP client allowing uploading and downloading. So you have to use Windows Explorer if you want to do the FTP thing. Um, the port forwarding, you know, point and click. The detection, no alerting is likely. I mean, it, you, you are going to have a record of the connection, but it's not going to be, um, it, it's not going to have the, you know, the security guys uh, uh, knocking at your desk. All right, this next one, this next one should not even be here. This next one I, 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 th I think is, 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 is one of the most ridiculous things that, that continues to, to, to plague our industry. And, and, and that is, um, uh, booting from, from, from a, 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 a live CD or, or USB device. 
And the reason that I, I have this one here is because this is no longer the, you know, booting from a USB device or, or creating a, U, a bootable USB device is no longer a, 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 just among the technical realm, right? Because you can get Windows 8 on a, on a uh, bootable device. You can get Windows 10, 100 bucks. Uh, Iron Key will sell you bootable Windows 10. Um, you know, the, the, the use of, you know, Linux Mint or Puppy or, or whatever your favorite version is, right? I mean, how difficult is it to make, to make a, a, a bootable Linux device? And some of those, you know, to, to the non-technical user are going to feel very, very, very homey like, 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 like Windows. So um, it's very rare that I, I find that um, uh, networks have actually locked their, their um, BIOSes down. And further, if they've locked their BIOSes down, they, they often don't lock their boot order correctly. So they'll still allow booting to a live CD. Well, because it's not a, it's not a writable device, right? Well, you boot to a live CD, and then you just plug in a USB device and you mount that, and that's how you, you exfiltrate data. So it's like, ah! <laughs> okay, well, that's, that's, that's my dozen. Um, you know, it's, it's funny, as, as, as an auditor, you know, I, 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 I look at access control uh, records all the time until I'm blue in the face. One of the things that blows me away, absolutely blows me away, is when I look at who has accounts on the network, it's always more than you ever think that, 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 that would be there, you know, especially if they're not totally on top of it, and even then. So, so the, who are the threats that, that could, could use these types of things? Well, the, the threats are the obvious ones. I mean, employees, the disgruntled, uh, you know, the insider threat. That's the obvious one. But I think these other ones are, are, are equally threats. And, you know, the, the, the vendors, the contractors, the consult, consultants who often have elevated privileges and who often don't have any allegiance to, to the people that they're serving and, and, and may have reasons to want to get, uh, you know, data off the network. Business partners, uh, visitors. One of the things is, is, is organizations will give a visitor network privilege to get out to the internet. It's like, are you kidding me? They, and I, you know, it's ridiculous that they, you know, they don't have a fully segregated uh, you know, Wi-Fi network for, for that. Foreign visitors, um, and, and not to pick on that, except that I have, I have personal experience knowing about significant intellectual property that was uh, uh, exfiltrated uh, uh, on, uh, by foreign visitors. You know, and then temps, short-term employees, interns, summer students, I mean, even people who, who you think, oh, geez, these people can't hurt us. Well, those are the people who, who probably are you know, more sophisticated around this thing than, than, than a lot of the network managers. And for crying out loud, leaving auditors on your network, you should never do that. All right, closing comments. Um, the, of, these, of these dozen uh, methods, uh, half or more will work uh, on, on any site that I've been to in, in, in the last couple of years. Um, the organizations are very, very unlikely to, to detect the, the exfiltration. Um, again, in, in real time, a forensic examination would show it, but I'm not talking about that. The awareness of these uh, bypasses by, by uh, the IT uh, uh, professionals, the people who are setting it up, is, is almost zero. Um, I'm sure that other people are aware of these, right? I mean, some of the folks I, I, I saw smiling when I talked about that one. It's probably your favorite one to exfiltrate it. <laughs> I, I'm not the only one who knows about these, but by a long shot. The reason, for the, the reason for my presentation here is, is, is very simple. Without awareness of these bypasses, um, the preventative controls are, are almost uh, never going to be installed. So, um, so that's it. Uh, I would love to hear about your favorite bypass because I bet, uh, I bet you can take my dozen and more than double it. So um, any thoughts, questions? Sir? Um, of your clients that you've audited uh, that have gone through the audit process, uh, which have had the uh, best success for mediating against those bypasses and why? So uh, it, it really depends on the technical management uh, for the network. 
uh, and how committed they are to remedying it. And, and I'm not trying to give you one of these BSE answers, but one of the things that um, one of the things that I know is it depends upon how committed the organization is to closing holes. So um, the simple answer is that when I come back the next year, usually seven or eight of these controls are closed. And then the year after that, the rest get closed because I kind of hammer on them again. So, um, but some of them, as I say, are more difficult to, to, to close, like the, you know, this, this thing with the, with the Android phone, because it's, you know, if you, if you're using, uh, I don't know, semantic endpoint protection or GFI or whatever, it's not simply clicking the button saying, shut it off. It doesn't, you, you have to do something more. You have to push, push the policy. So that becomes a little bit more complex. I guess what I mean is, do you have uh, like a, a suggested framework that you have clients look at, or uh, do you basically just say, you know, this is what I did to yeah. fix this thing? Yeah. We, we, we've been through it enough so that if they can't figure it out on the, by themselves, they'll give us a call and, you know, we can, we can point them in the right directions or, or connect them with other folks that we know would be willing to, you know, serve the community and, and help them. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, the worst thing an auditor can do is, is dump a report on something, on somebody that they, you know, can't fix. Yeah. Yeah. No, we, we've, we've been around this so many times that, that we kind of know what has to be done. I mean, we know where to look. So, yeah. So, I, I'm get, sorry. Uh, how often do you see techniques like this versus more sophisticated techniques like SSH or VPN tunnels or IP over DNS tunnels or other things like that? Well, I, I, um, I actually wanted to take out remote access sort of out of my, my talk because I, I, I think of, you know, the ability to do uh, exfiltration using using uh, facilities that have been provided or, you know, that, that's kind of a, a talk for maybe next year. But um, um, so I, I think I think there's a lot of opportunities for people to do, you know, remote remote type stuff. Yeah, I, I was just trying to really, really think about the absolute simplest ones. You know, uh, there are more. I mean, if people want. So, if people wanted to certainly if technical people wanted to get data out. I mean, that, that's that's that that's possible. I was just trying to think of, you know, the, the simple people. Simple people. I didn't mean that they're simple. I meant that. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I, someone back here had had their hand up. Sir. Uh, Um, I will not, I mean, I, obviously what I'll do is I'll create, you know, a text file or something like that. I, I'm not going to actually take my client's data and exfiltrate it. I, I'm, I'm kind of crazy, but I'm not that crazy. So I, I will, I will take data that I put on their network and, uh, because I can get, because, yeah, because I can, I can get it on their network as easy as I can get it off, to be honest. So I'll, I'll take something that will demonstrate that I can, you know, get, uh, a, a good chunk of data out. Um, why, do, why do you ask? I'm curious. Um, because what? Oh, I, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right. And certainly not the way I'm using it. And and if you if you want, yeah, right, right. No, you're, you're absolutely you're right, right. Excellent question. Uh, as a, one of the wonderful things about being an auditor is you can be a real jerk. So you can go in and say, "This is what I, I want from you," because because I'm I'm being paid by by the the board. Okay, so I, I can so I get to pick I get to pick the workstation I want, and I always use user credentials. So I never make the mistake. Of taking a, taking a facilities that IT gives me because they're always going to be different than, than the actual production, um, and I never use any credentials of someone other than someone who I have selected. So what I'll do is is I'll, you know, it's, it's, as an auditor, I, I mean, you wouldn't believe how lucky I am 
uh, I can I can always kind of pick the right ones to look for. You know, it's always you know it's always Sally in, in, in auditing that has the elevated credentials or I, I mean I'm good at that. So yeah, but I, I, I get to choose that. I, I would never do it with my own. I don't I I don't usually even connect connect my, my stuff up to their network. I, I don't want them to hose me. So Ma'am? What if um, your experience has been with companies using whitelisting applications? Some of your techniques utilize software that might not already be present on the Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's funny you say that because I, I would have expected a lot more whitelisting. I, I don't see much whitelisting. I, 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 I just don't see it. I, I, I hear a lot of people talking about it, but it's... When you do, is it, is it harder to exfiltrate data or is it just a different method? I, I think it's just a different method because the, um, the, the applications uh, that they would whitelist are not going to be problematic for me to use the drivers that I want. So because the drivers would already be, would already be installed. Um, so I don't, I, I don't think that would be a, a, a problem. So, yeah, yeah. No, no. What has, what's made it the most difficult to exfiltrate data out of client networks or is it always easy? Um, geez, that's a good question. I mean, so, some endpoint protection systems are a little bit better than others, for example. I mean, a little bit. Um, um, but I, I, I always get through. I just always do. It, I, and, and that's, again, that's the reason for the, for the paper is because I, I, I can, I mean, I've got a dozen. You know, when you, when you have that many tools, one of the tools is going to work. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't say that there's any one particular thing that says, geez, if they have that, you know, it's going to be, it's become problematic. You know, it's not like I can say, you know, semantic endpoint protection with, with, the, with the network aware stuff that they have is going to cause me problems. Cause me problems when I scan, but that's a, that's a different problem. So I, I can't say. Yeah, yeah. So, so I wish I could uh, uh, see what, you know, really sophisticated networks are. You know, I'd love to, you know, if anyone wanted to volunteer their network that, you know, where they work at, uh, you know, Fidelity or, you know, one of the, you know, Bank of America or, you know, you know someone who's, who's, who's really, I'd, I'd love to take the challenge on. I'd do it for free, actually. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, so, well, thank you. Thank you. And, and, if, and if you do want to talk with me privately about your favorite method, I'm all yours. <laughs> thank you.